أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم آمن الرسول بما أنزل إليه به والمؤمنون آمن الرسول بما أنزل إليه من ربه كل آمن بالله وملائكته وكتبه ورسله لا نفرق بين أحد من رسله وقالوا سمعنا وأطعنا غفرانك ربنا غفرانك ربنا وإليك المصير آمن الرسول بما أنزل إليه من ربه والمؤمنون كل آمن بالله وملائكته وكتبه ورسله لا نفرق بين أحد من رسله وقالوا سمعنا وأطعنا غفرانك ربنا وقالوا سمعنا وأطعنا غفرانك ربنا إليك المصير لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها لها ما كسبت وعليها ما تسبت ربنا لا تؤاخذنا إن نسينا أو أخطأنا ربنا ولا تحمل علينا إصرا كما حملته على الذين من قبلنا ربنا ولا تحملنا ما لا طاقة لنا به واعف 
وعنا واغفر لنا وارحمنا ربنا ولا تحملنا ما لا طاقة لنا به واعف عنا واغفر لنا وارحمنا أنت مولانا أنت مولانا فانصونا على القوم الكافرين صدق الله العلي العظيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله الطيبين الطاهرين thank uh, Abu Bay Society Queen Mary's University for the kind invitation and inshallah today's workshop uh, go over some key points about presenting the struggle, the mission of Imam Hussein alayhi salam at university campus. Before we start doing that, um, I will just give you an overview. I will talk slightly about the, the time, the era that you as students are living in, and what are the major challenges in, the, in this day and age. Then we'll go and move on to talk about presenting Imam Hussein alayhi salam this mission and struggle to Muslims, how we could do it, how we should do it, and to non-Muslims as well. So to start with, um, I will just uh, remind myself and you about how we should not um, be misguided about the priorities in life, how we should never be distracted from our main objectives regardless what the distractions are for you at your stage probably your degree and your exams and graduating probably when you inshallah graduate successfully it will be your work and family life and so on and these things do serve as distractions unfortunately most of the time unless we are very very careful this is chapter 9 surah at tawbah verse 24 I'll recite it in Arabic, then I will attempt the translation to the best of my knowledge, inshallah. Try to listen to this and apply it to yourself as a university student, as a graduate, as a person with responsibilities, whatever the forms of responsibilities are. وأزواجكم وعشيرتكم وأموال اقترفتموها وتجارة تخشون كسادها ومساكن ترضونها أحب إليكم من الله ورسوله وجهاد في سبيله فتربصوا فتربصوا حتى يأتي الله بأمره والله لا يهدي القوم فاسقين Translation Say to the people if your parents, your children, your brothers, your spouses, your families, your tribes, if all of this and a wealth that you have acquired and a trade that you fear the loss of, it could be your degree, your profession, and shelters, housing that you love, if all of this, starting from the families, wealth, housing, if all of this is more beloved to you, is dearer to you than Allah, His Messenger, and jihad, and struggling in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then wait. 
wait until, until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring his command to pass and Allah does not guide al qawm al fasiqeen the wrongdoers pretty heavy warning really for those who take in life exams or profession or family as hurdles for them to participate in for example in spreading the message of Allah Hussain that's what I'm trying to get you to think whatever the priorities are whatever the barriers are whatever the, your responsibilities are nothing nothing should distract us from serving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's purpose and if Imam Hussain alayhi salam sacrifice his life to save this religion then I say we claim that we are his followers and, we're, and we would have been happy to sacrifice our lives with him on the plains of Karbala. I say today at Queen Mary's in London, are we ready to sacrifice some of our time for Imam Hussain Spreading his message, defending his course. So a bit of overview about the major, the major challenges that you are facing at the moment. For my basic understanding of the world we live in at the moment, the believers, the Muslims, the followers of Ahlul Bayt, the students, face a common theme in this world. That is a sensation that religion, divine guidance, needs not to have any presence in our daily lives on ideological level and practical level that is the theme of the world we're living in at the moment let me elaborate so the educational system the media all the educational institutions that you are studying at they're all trying to preach one message that is God does not exist a recent documentary came out on BBC last week continuously attacking this notion this concept that God does not exist so atheism on the ideological level and this leads obviously consequently practically socially to a very liberal style of living a style of living which is deprived of the presence of God deprived from the presence of religion deprived from the necessity to be a follower to be obedient to be guided by a set of moral concepts of religious origin because of misunderstanding of religion if some misconceptions about religion or maybe as we're going to come to explain mispresentation of religion are you all, before I move on, this is a workshop by the way, so I want you to interrupt me. Are you all aware of this era that most of your colleagues at the moment, if you ask them when you are about to form a family, are you going to get married? Some of them will say, a significant percentage of them will say, well, actually, do you need marriage? What is marriage? Piece of paper? In church or the mosque? We don't need marriage. You're going to send your children to a religious school to teach them some of the religious moral values not really we don't need them so a sense the new generation is developing with this with this with this theme in life that we could live without the presence of god or religion that is the theme of the western civilization and it's obviously because of its domination and because the whole of the world looks up to the west and this is obviously expanding if you go back home most of you your parents come either from asia or the middle east go back there there's the education the education uh, the educational system and the educated elite a significant percentage of them think religion does not need to have any presence in our lives do we all see this yeah when was the last time we heard the word god in a physics lecture or biology lecture. I did medicine for five years at St. George's University of London. No one mentioned God. In fact, continuously, for five years we were bombarded 
by one stream, one point of view. God does not exist. And religion, religions, troublemakers. Avoid them. You could do well without them. That is the theme. So that's the domination of atheism, liberalism, lack of presence of God. That is one global challenge for humanity and believers overall. And you need to be aware of these challenges so you could, when you are members, active members, inshallah, of Ahlul society, and when you graduate, uh, you will be, inshallah, continue to contribute back to your community. You need to be aware of the challenges. What is happening out there? What do I need to do? And the other major challenge is within our own house, the Muslim house. And that challenge is Wahhabism. Wahhabism, despite being a tiny fraction of the Muslim Ummah, neither Shia Muslims nor Sunni Muslims, they are dominating the Islamic educational system and the Islamic media. They are appearing as if they are, if they are the spokesperson of Islam, forgetting that this school of thought is only about 250 years old and that the major school of thought like the majority of the Muslims, the Sunni Muslims and the Shia Muslims do not exist. If you want to learn about Islam, it's a Wahhabi website. If you want to uh, explore Islam, it's a Wahhabi cleric, it's a Wahhabi preacher. Despite a small number of Muslims belonging to this, very influential. Just like you know, atheism and liberalism, there's a small fraction of society that believe in them, but actually they are dominant. With Wahhabism, obviously, um, we think <coughs> it's a school of thought that is, number one, quite extreme in its understanding that it labels both Sunni Muslims and Shia Muslims as non-Muslims and it claims that the path of Islam is only its own path. And obviously with li liberalism and atheism we think it's leading humanity in the wrong way. Could I ask you before I move on to presenting Mount Hussein's struggle and mission? At university comes. Can I ask you to think of examples of how a liberal style in life, like the Western society, like the, like the society you live in in London now, a, a style in life that is deprived from the presence of religion, what sort of negative outcomes do you think are out there because of this style? I mean, you've listened to me for the last seven minutes or so, and I'm assuming we are talking on the same wavelength then. But I just want to make sure you understand what I mean when I say it's dangerous and it's resulting in a negative impact on society. Can you think of examples? I think there are a lot of psychological problems. Psychological problems, like? Um, like depression. Depression, yeah. And the disease of the, of the time. You don't see a lot of family leaders there. You know, family is a war. Okay, so it's a bit of loneliness, individual-based society rather than a community and a family. When you go back home, you're there just facing life on your own, pretty much. Yeah? Could you elaborate? Could you think of other examples, other aspects? Lack of brotherhood of themselves, no one really helping each other unless getting Well done. So lack of uh, this brotherhood in society, okay? In general, people you know, walk on the street, you know, they don't even know who their neighbours are, yet alone asking about whether their neighbours need some help or not. It's very individual based, s centred around the individual rather than the community system. Very good. So we're talking about the economical model. Liberalism to be set, you think free, but I think it's you actually you're being misguided. But this notion of being set free from any boundaries, including the economical model, is, should be, kind of the first example in your mind, which is resulting, which is having a detrimental effect on the people uh, of our world at the moment. The economical si system, at the essence of it, Islam and most religions have very strong stance against interest. Right? 
all religions, especially Islam, has got very strong stance against interest. Yet people chose to go against it about 600 years ago. The first banking system developed in Italy. And yes, within the first 20 years, you might have not seen any you know, bad effect of interest. But guess what? Do you know what the public debt of the world, of the, of the banking system was in 2008? You should be aware of these figures. Do you know how much was the debt in the world market, financial wa market? The debt, I mean, trillions. there were figures. Sorry. In trillions. In trillions, to be specific, three trillion dollars. So three, yeah, 10 to the power 12 of money that existed in figures but actually it wasn't there so when the whole thing collapsed there was no cash there was no real value and also we see it's part of a result of uh, it's, uh, the, the, impl the implications of having the interest in the financial market and the economical model more examples more individual examples so this is we're talking about globally the economical depression no brotherhood. Do you have any figures in mind? As believers, you should have figures in mind to tell people. Because on Ashura, the whole point of this is when Ashura awareness week comes, and where you're on the stall trying to present Imam Hussein salam, trying to present Islam, as we're going to talk about it over the next half an hour, inshallah, you should have some figures to tell them that the world is in a bad shape. Look around you. A figure that I always like to think about is that these figures are rising but the latest one we have is that 25% of the children of the United Kingdom and the figure is very similar in the United States they live in single parent families if some of you here are not appreciating the impact of this I would like you to go and think again after today's workshop Brothers and sisters, for about 10,000 years of human civilization, the model that has worked is a family of a father and a mother. So for us to come in the last 50 years and say, actually, we could deal with a quarter of the, of, of the society's children living in a single parent. That's, it's acceptable. It's not a problem. It is a problem. It's a problem for, for the child's well-being. And if you are so interested in, in money, it's a problem for the taxpayer. Because that child with a teenager mother, who the father has run away with no responsibility, you're going to pay for his education. You're going to pay for his increased social needs. You, the taxpayer, let alone the negative impact on the child. And that's because, I hope you all appreciate, we're not, we're not following the family, the social model that is derived from religion, which is a holy marriage, commitment, no relationship before, that strong commitment, no contract, no responsibility, and so on. Brother. What about Islam or people have a negative influence on Islam? They have a negative impression of Islam. Yeah. Yeah. I mean that. But, like, for example, they look at war. Yeah. Exactly. So, uh, so a global misunderstanding of religion yeah. and Islamophobia, and because of this, we're running away from religion as humanity. Yeah. Because of these misunderstandings that we could be, oh, religions are enforced by wars, religion cause wars, and so on. Because of these misunderstandings, people are obviously running away, and they're adopting a very liberal style, which is unfortunately we are paying the price of at the moment. Sister. Okay, so when we caught the figure of 25% of children in single parent homes, so the sister point was well, Islam actually accepts this. Of course it accepts this because it allows divorce to happen. But is it the model that Islam is trying to encourage? 
Is it the model that is the healthier environment for children? If it is unfortunately the result of a war that led to you know, 25% of families being, you know, of wives being widowed, you can't do anything about it. But actually, look at the West. The West is representing at the moment the best product of humans' struggle to achieve happiness. Superficially, economical stability, political stability, security, advancement. With all, with all this, 25% of your children on the street are living either without a father or without a mother. That is not a healthy environment. If you are forced to accept it because of a natural disaster or war, fair enough, tolerate it. But not when you have a very stable civilization in the West and still you can't <coughs> secure a household, a family environment for 25% of the children. There are no wars in the West, there is no poverty in the West, yet 25% of the children living in a substandard for their upbringing. That is a major disaster. Unless obviously you don't care and you think, oh, it's going to work. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. Look at the schools today. Speak to your colleagues who are doing teaching at primary and secondary education and ask them about the, the level of awareness and commitment of students and pupils these days. Hear about the stories. What you saw on the rights of in the London and the rights in the streets is just a taster of how low we got in this society, unfortunately, because of this lack of the presence of religion. I repeat the major challenge of the time that you're living in at the moment. Globally, presence of religion is less and less because of misunderstanding, mispresentation. We need to be aware of this. Within the House of Islam, Wahhabism is taking the front of the stage and is presenting itself as the carrier of Islam. And that's a, a big danger. So, we move on to Ashura Awareness Week, to Muhammad Hussain alayhi salam. So, we've talked about Wahhabism, and they are representing, as you said, the, the Islam to the West and to other non-Muslims. Absolutely. Is that because we are, we are not investing in our religion, in our like Sunnism and Shiaism, or is it because they are investing and we can't do anything? No. Y your question is, okay, why Wahhabism is dominating the scene, okay? of the Muslim Ummah, exactly as you said, they are organized and working while the remaining of the Muslim Ummah, the Sunni Muslims and the Shia Muslims who are brothers, who accept each other and are, their scholars are directly against the Zionist occupation while the Wahhabi scholars are not, for example. You know, Wahhabism, uh, most of scholars in Saudi Arabia have never said anything about Israel. While all the Sunni and the Shia scholars have been crying out for the last 60, 70 years for the help of Palestine. So this school of thought, well funded, well organized, and it is not serving the bigger aims of Islam, unfortunately is active and the rest of the Muslim Ummah is quiet. And you are the Muslim Ummah, of course, part of it. Back to Ashura Awareness Week, once you are living in this misunderstanding of the challenges you face here. Practically, there are a few challenges, practical challenges for you on the day when you have in your store. Amongst them is to be able to present the message of Imam Hussein in a very concise manner in a very short period of time. Because the students will be walking past your stores and booklets and you either have five seconds to attract their attention or you just lost them, okay? They didn't see something that would interest them. I mean, the whole point of Ashura al Week is to raise awareness of Imam Hussein to people who don't know about Imam Hussein and his relevance to their lives. And we will be talking about the relevance of Imam Hussein in a minute to the Muslims and to the non-Muslims, slightly differently. Okay, you need to be aware of how you present him differently. So you've got a few seconds when that colleague of yours is passing by by you, saw the leaflets, didn't see anything that's interesting, and you've got a few seconds. You're either going to catch their attention or not. 
After today's discussion, inshallah, you should have some quick phrases, some statements to summarize the, some of the important lessons drawn from Imam Hussain to these people. So you could get their attention and spend a few more minutes taking them on the side, explaining them more in depth. You can't simply, you know, try and attract someone's attention by saying, excuse me, do you want to hear about Imam Hussain, the grandson of the Prophet of Islam who died 14 centuries ago? They won't listen to you if you say that. So make sure you, you know, amongst you, before uh, the week, inshallah, you sit down and agree on certain phrases. Like, for example, that's my own suggestion, and please feel free to draw any phrases that you see relevant and practical. I'm not trying to cheat people, just trying to get their attention that this is actually relevant to you. Like, do you want to hear about an excellent example of altruism? I said that over three seconds. Okay. If you can get the attention of that student by saying something relevant, an excellent example of altruism, what is that? Who are you talking about? Okay. Do you want to hear what happened to Islam 50 years after the death of the Prophet? What happened to Islam 50 years after the death of the Prophet? I'll tell you in a minute. So you're trying to just get them with a question. Tell them a, a phrase, something that would get their interest. Don't try and pass the message immediately. This is the man who saved Islam. You can do that when they are with you and ready to listen to you. But try and get their attention with a phrase, something that you develop between you. And these are just two simple examples of you doing that. OK. First part, how do we present this Imam Hussain to the Muslims? Right? And then we move on to the non Muslims. Do you have any questions before I move on? Oh, no? Everyone's waiting, inshallah. I hope it's relevant and practical. Okay. Imam al Hussein for Muslims. Let me give you just a quick historical background because most of us, including in our centers, followers of Abu Bakr, we tend to talk about Imam al Hussein's movement. From what day? Maximum, if you stretch back and the speaker is well aware, he would speak about Imam Hussein from what? First. His? First of Muharram? Hajj. From Hajj, which is approximately. He left on the 8th of the Hajj, didn't he? And Muawiyah died about two and a half months before that. So, maximum, they would go back either 1st or 2nd of Muharram. Or they would go back 8th the Hijjah, yeah, when he left Hajj before the day of Arafah. Or they would go back as far as when Muawiyah died, which was two and a half months before that. To me, that's one of the main mispresentations of the revolution of Muhammad Hussain done by us. You know when I spoke about religion and how there's a global misunderstanding? Because we mispresent it. Imam Hussein's movement started with the death of his brother, Imam Hassan, which was when? Okay, so Muawiyah died year 60 of the Hijrah. Imam Hassan died, he's not died, he was killed 10 years before that, year 50 of the Hijrah, which is why I said in one of the phrases I'm trying to get you to use to get the attention of a Muslim. Do you want to hear about what happened to Islam 50 years after the death of the Prophet? It's actually 50 years of the Hijrah, so it will be about 40 years after the death of the Prophet. Excuse me for the correction. Year 50 of the Hijrah, when Muawiyah killed Imam al Hassan, -Islam, listen to this part so you've got a, a vision of how Imam, Imam Hussein, how, how relevant is he for the whole of the religion of Islam, not for Shia Muslims, for the whole of the religion of Islam. Year 50, Hijrah, Imam al-Hassan, killed by Muawiyah, 10 years. These 10 years are essential for us to appreciate the importance of Imam al-Hussain for Islam. Because during these 10 years, the three elements needed for this religion to survive as we have it today, alhamdulillah, grace to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to the martyrs, and the first amongst them is Imam al-Hussain, Three elements are needed 
Muawiyah for 10 years he attacked all of these three elements three elements number one the true guardians of Islam Awliyaullah if you want Islam to survive you need to know who are the true guardians of Islam you can't just assume that everyone knows about Islam and I'll listen to anyone who said oh I heard the Prophet saying something especially you are 50 years after Hijrah so about 40 years after the death of the Prophet you need to know the true guardians you need to know who are the true opposite enemies of Islam yeah you need to be aware who the enemies are because otherwise you might be listening to them you might be learning from them and hence the religion cannot survive if you don't know who the true guardians and you learn from them and you don't know who the true enemies and you avoid them are you all happy about this so it's very simple but Muawiyah is very clever by the way Muawiyah is a very clever man guardians enemies and the third thing you need like any religion for any movement to survive you need the support the loyal supporters if you don't have loyal supporters you can't do anything Imam al-Mahdi today does not have enough loyal supporters so he's waiting he is waiting yeah so even if you have the greatest leader ever if you don't have loyal supporters you can't do anything you just have to wait okay three elements just quickly over ten years look at what happened to them the guardians who are Ahlul Bayt salam, Muawiyah completely changed the position the true guardians are Ahlul Bayt and the true enemies are the progeny of the Umayyads the cursed tree in the Quran have you, have you read this verse وَالشَّجَرَةَ الْمَلْعُونَ in the Quran yeah the cursed tree the tree that starting from Abu Sufyan from Muawiyah from Yazid and continuously they fought against the original Islam from day one and they only accepted Islam forced to accept it yeah the people the enemies from within Muawiyah what he did with a propaganda of narrations with mass media with domination of the Islamic educational system at his time he flipped the coin he changed the position the true enemies became the guardians presented with false narrations and the true guardians became enemies of Islam do you appreciate that for these 10 years it was the beginning of 80, or 80 long years of weekly practice of the Muslim generations which could have been you every Friday after you finish Salah you stand up and repeat after the Imam cursing of Ali ibn Abi Talib Muawiyah started this after year 50 he started educating the new generation that this man the guardian of Islam is an enemy of Allah and Muslims in their thousands from Sham, Iraq, Egypt Arabian Peninsula they would stand up in their Friday prayer and curse Ali ibn Abi Talib curse Ali ibn Abi Talib if it wasn't for Imam Hussein until today we would have been cursing Ali ibn Abi Talib until today if you want to present Imam Hussein to Muslims you need to understand this I know most preachers say Imam Hussein with his valor did something and then he stripped the, the leader from his authority there's something deeper about it it's not a political struggle I don't accept any of you saying that the struggle of Imam Hussein was Imam Hussein versus the dictator of his time it wasn't like that it was Imam Hussein versus the model of the whole of the Ummah the state of the time Imam Hussein did not come out against Yazid as an individual Yazid is a product of the model that Muawiyah established Imam Hussein came out to save Islam from the model that Muawiyah designed which is to attack the three elements true guardians make them hate make them enemies true enemies make them guardians and Muawiyah suddenly only been a Muslim for about two and a half years became Waliullah 
became a Khalifa. Do you know what Khalifa means? Khalifa doesn't, at the time, Khalifa did not mean a governor. <coughs> Khalifa meant an inheritor of the Prophet's responsibility to teach people how to lead their lives. And so did Yazid, obviously, we reached such a low stage that Yazid became Waliullah. Okay? So this is, this is what Imam Hussein came out against. Not a political struggle against a, decree, a dictator. That's a mispresentation of the struggle of Imam Hussein. And the third element, the loyal supporters of Ali ibn Abi Talib, of the Prophet, the people who knew the true narrations about Ahlul Bayt. I don't, I'm not talking about Shia Muslims, even Sunni Muslims at the time. Even people who did not agree 100% with Ali ibn Talib and Hussein. He silenced Muawiyah, silenced all of them. He wanted to keep that generation that, left, that lived with the companions, with the Prophet, silent. So his propaganda could overtake and these guys would die. And until today, the Muslim Ummah would have been seeking nearness to Allah with Muawiyah and his progeny. And seeking nearness by cursing Ali and his progeny. And imagine what would the Muslim Ummah would be looking like if these leaders were awliya Allah. So he attacked the loyalists, he silenced them, and the new generation of Muslims starting to grow. And Imam Hussein came out to save the religion of Islam from this, not a political struggle. How are you going to present this in a couple of minutes to your fellow Muslims? You need to be quick, you need to think about it, you need to take phrases that would get the attention of that brother and sister. Do you all, kind of, are you all happy with the, I, I just want you to understand it, then it's up to you how you present it. You want to tell them, shall I tell you when was Ali ibn Abi Talib the companion cursed? Do you want to tell me, you know, do, you, do you know when did it start? Do you know why it, stopped, why it was stopped? Who woken up the ummah? Obviously the cursing did not stop for another 70 years, total of 80 years. We're not suggesting, we're not saying that the impact of Mount Hussein's revolution was immediate. The next day, people realized who the true guardians are. But he started a movement. He started, his impact lasted and it continues to last until today. Yeah? So we're not saying the impact was immediate. Are you happy about this? Presenting the three elements and how he attacked them? The loyalists that you need for this religion to survive, silence them? True guardians, enemies, true enemies, guardians, and so on. Yeah? Shall we move on? Okay. Another important point that you could tell your Muslim brother and sister, it's only today that's being relevant. When I was at university, uh, people weren't interested in, in this topic, which is living in this happy time that you see some of your brothers and sisters in Muslim countries and Arab countries coming out against their dictators. Living in this 2011 uh, joyful time that we see our Ummah waking up finally. Have you asked yourselves? Have the Muslims asked themselves? How come after centuries of being educated that we the Muslims should accept our rulers and our governors no matter what they do to us because they are Muslims. What happened suddenly? What happened to the people of Egypt? That the people of Tunisia, people of Yemen. For centuries, state paid preachers, go, go and read the books, go, they're still there. They will tell you if your governor was a Muslim, you should accept. And this was the sedative state that the Muslim Ummah was in for centuries. It's the first time that leaders are actually coming, sorry, that the people are actually coming out against their leaders because they're fed up. For centuries they've been sedated. And they were told, in Islam, you should accept your ruler. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's decision. State paid preachers. Yeah? Have you asked yourself, has any, any of them, obviously things are different for the followers of Ahlul Bayt, because if you look at countries where the followers of Ahlul Bayt are there as a majority, like Iraq and Bahrain, Iran, where the dictators were there continuously, every couple of years, the people would come out against their leader. 
Saddam's time as a case study, beginning of the 70s, late 70s, 1980, Muhammad Baqar Sadr, 1991, with the uprising after the, first, uh, after the second Gulf War, 1998, with later Ayatollah Muhammad, Muhammad Sadr Qas Sadr. So over the period of 30 years, you've got about five times, because the followers of Ahl al-Bayt don't have state paid preachers to tell them you should accept your ruler. What happened to the people of Egypt? When I was at my previous job, a Libyan doctor who is fed up with Gaddafi, who is, you know, he can see that you know the presence of this dictator is wrong. And even his people, his the people of Benghazi were just starting to move and make public rejection. He came up to me and said to me, you know, I want my people to do it, but is it Islamically acceptable? So I tell the Muslim Ummah that you shouldn't listen to state preachers anymore, state paid preachers anymore. Alhamdulillah, they're not. And if some Muslims are out there looking for legitimacy of what they're doing, they should look up at Imam al Hussein. I don't need a scholar who's paid by Saudi Arabia to tell me that I need to accept my ruler if he's unjust, if he's violent. I've got Imam Hussein. And now I want you to tell the fellow Muslim students on your campus that if you're ever still wondering about whether it's acceptable or not, this common sense thing that, you know, he's unjust, he's a dictator, he's a butcher. And the preachers are telling you, accept brother, tolerate brother. Tell them, don't worry, you have a legitimate figure, the grandson of the Prophet, an Imam for all Muslims, who was the first to lead the struggle against Muslim dictators and Muslim unjust rulers. And that's a significant point. I want you to think about it. Think the sedative effect for centuries and what happened now and how some Muslims are still questioning whether they are whether they were what they were doing is right or not. And even if you ask them, they say obviously it's right, but we can't find evidence in the religion. Because of their unfortunately long uh, education, miseducation about Islam, they can't find evidence. I want you to help the Muslim Ummah. I want you to come out there and tell the Muslim Ummah there is legitimacy to, to what you're doing because of Imam Hussein. So if I ask you, if I am that Muslim student passing by, if I say, okay, so Muawiyah attacked the three elements, but how did the struggle of Imam Hussein help to save the three elements? What would you respond? Get you to think. This may not be the examples you're going to come up with or the answers, but just I want you to think. Fair enough. So you, you call the attention of a brother or a sister, you say to them, do you want to hear about Ali ibn Talib being cursed? You say, stuff for Allah. When was he cursed? Take him to the side and start talking to him. Explain to him about the three elements. You say, well, mashallah, but uh, how did the struggle of Imam Hussein help the three elements being saved? Or being you know, presented in the right way? I mean, the fact that he took his family, uh, you know, uh, proves that it wasn't a political struggle. Okay. I mean, it wasn't, it can't be uh, seen as a, a battle. It was a massacre. Okay. More of a massacre than a battle. So a very good point. So the fact that he was, you know, accompanied by, her, by his family, not equipped with weapons of war, heavy war, except simple weapons, like a sword, yeah? It shows that he wasn't going there out there for a political struggle, for you know, to try and claim authority or political position. That's a very that's a, a very important feature of the struggle of Hussein. So. I think one of the biggest distinctions between Muawiyah and Yazid was that Muawiyah's uh, uh, you know, sort of disbelief in anti-Islamic notions were hidden. So okay. openly he was like a good Muslim and he was really good at all the PR stuff. Okay. And yeah. But Yazid was openly pretty bad, and he was meant to be the leader of the Muslims. So by fighting Yazid, he exposed him as openly bad. Very good. So you're trying to you're trying to expose the true enemies. Yeah. You can say it by words, 
who can demonstrate it. And the struggle of Imam Hussain when he came out with his family, this, this noble stance of him, right, to put his life on the life of his companions and his family, his loyal family and companions, forward. And the army of the state led by the so-called leader of the Muslims, Yazid, was suddenly exposed. Suddenly exposed. This is the heritage of the Prophet. How dare you attack and surround a family of the Prophet, people unarmed. Imam Hussein continuously said, well, you know, I didn't come here asking to fight you, I'm defending myself. Why are you stopping me to come from... So the, from the whole scenario, exactly as you said, Yazid and the whole the model was exposed. And this was led by certain revolutions and uprisings after the Matim al Hussein. It happened in Medina. And again, that exposed Yazid. Do you know how? The army of Yazid took the liberty to attack the citizens of Medina, the city of the Prophet. And attacked in an Un honorable way all the women there and the figures caught about 1,000 virgin Muslim girls were attacked on that occasion. This is the army of Yazid against the people of Medina and we're not saying the people of Medina were Shias or Sunnis we're not saying they were the supporters of Imam Hussein, which is why this is relevant for the whole of the Muslim Ummah. So again this exposed Yazid and followed then by Mecca. The people of Mecca revolted against him. And he attacked Mecca. Okay? So the struggle exposed the true enemies. Okay, that's very good. Other aspects? It was like an awakening. Like an awakening. Very good. An awakening to the Ummah. Exposing, you know, uh, the so-called leader and showing the true nature of Hussein alayhi salam and the family of the Prophet The fact that was hidden and his father being cursed on the member for 10 years, this is the son of Ali ibn Abi Talib. This is what he represents. These are the family of the Prophet and the loyal supporters. So showing the true nature of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. Add to that, Imam Hussein didn't just go and fight and defend himself and die. For two and a half months, approximately, between the death of Muawiyah and between the 8th of the Hijjah, when he left Medina going to Kufa, he used these months to set the loyalist, the third element, is to, set the, to set the loyalist free in the Muslim nation, to talk about Ahlul Bayt. So basically, mass mass preaching against the propaganda of Muawiyah for 10 years. And these were people, were noble people, were known amongst their communities, not a state paid narrator by Muawiyah. These were people who were known amongst their tribes and their families. He ordered them to go out and speak about Ahl al-Bayt And he spent, he left, you probably know this, he left Medina to Mecca, and he waited in Mecca until the 8th of the Hajjah. And the Hajjaj were coming, he would meet them and teach them about Islam, teach them about Ahlul Bayt. Not obviously teach them how to pray, but teach them about the three elements that they need for the religion to survive. Okay? So expose the true nature of the state, expose the true nature of Ahlul Bayt, preach for the Muslims for a couple of months, and obviously the shock, the awakening that we discussed it has loosened the grip of the state on the loyalist narrators and after the, the, the collapse of the state of Yazid all narrators, Shia narrators and Sunni narrators came out and started to teach Islam true Islam and for the first time in the history of Muslims because of Imam Hussein's revolution there was a separation made between the person who climbs the ladder and becomes the political leader, the Khalifa, and between someone who teach the Muslims their religion. Prior to Imam al-Hussein, the man, the two positions were combined in one person. It was the Khalifa, the political leader, and the person who teaches the religion. After Imam al-Hussein, 
to a significant degree. We're not saying it happened immediately, but gradually it was the, the result of his resurrection that all of the Muslims, Sunni Muslims and Shia Muslims, start taking the political leader as one thing. Yeah, because, you know, Marwan ibn Abdul al Malik, yeah, uh, or Marwan ibn al Hakam, who managed to secure the state after the death of Yazid. Marwan ibn al Hakam, no one took him as a, as a teacher of Islam because they know his background. So the whole of the Muslim faith was saved by this struggle of Imam al-Husayn al -Sana. Now I'm trying to explain it in long words, but you're going to have to condense it, make phrases, be able to present it to your Muslim friends, brothers and sisters, when you're doing this, quickly, to the point. Okay? But you need to understand the background, of course, before you do that. Sister. Um, you're saying, you're saying Okay, so the question is, fine, so Yazid is, is, uh, is well exposed. Uh, well, some of the Wahhabis will try even to combat that, by the way. They'll tell you, oh, you know, be careful with Yazid. It's not, not, to, not to the same, but anyway. But of course, you're absolutely right. All Muslims, and I mean Sunni Muslims and Shia Muslims, hold Yazid as a corrupt figure. Imam Hussain al to have done exactly the right thing to do. Uh, but for Muawiyah, obviously, there is a debate. We're trying to explain to them historical accounts. We're not trying to convince them of a particular image. The aim of the stall is to raise awareness about the importance of Hussein A.S. And when they say to you, well, it's been 14 centuries, you know, and it's a battle that's, what, 70 people were killed in it? Probably less. There's been many battles after, after this with you know, very pious men and women being killed. So what's the point? Well, the point is there was a model started by Muawiyah. What do you think of Muawiyah? I don't know. All I know is he started cursing Ali ibn Abi Talib in every Friday prayer starting after the death of, after killing Imam al-Hassan. That's what I know about him. Okay? So, try to avoid conflict, but you're trying to draw them this talk. If they say to you, no, no, Imam Ali was, ne was never cursed, go and get your references and show, well, actually he was. At the time when Muawiyah was the ruler of the Muslim state. Okay? So obviously we're not trying to create conflict here. Please try and avoid uh, topics that would, you know, that would uh, distract you from passing the message of Hussein. We're trying to achieve, we're trying to tell the people, look, if you want legitimacy for the, for the uprising and the revolutions in the Middle East and the Muslim world, this is the figure. If you're trying to understand how the religion of Islam was safe, it's because of this man. What's the relevance of it to him, to the non-Muslim world? We'll come to it in a moment. We're trying to appreciate this man and draw lessons from him. And there are many lessons from Ashura that you could talk about. And I'm sure you are, you are aware of them. But I'm concentrating on the mission of Imam Hussain. Trying to avoid topics of conflict and practical advice. Some people would come to you and try to start a discussion about topics that would cause conflict. How would you deal with it? Someone would come to you and say, what do you say about the wives of the prophets? Straight away, face to face. You're trying to talk to a brother or a sister and comes to you, excuse me brother, what do you say about the wives of the prophets? Tell me. Wait, how are you going to deal with it? Okay, so tell them, Sorry, brother, do you want to answer the question? Could you come at 3.30? I'll meet you at the canteen. Mm -hmm. You want it now? I can't give it to you. 3.30, 4 o'clock maybe? Yeah? With a smile, shake the hands. See you later, brother, Shah. Yeah? Someone comes to you with a, an agenda, make sure you know not to be drawn into this agenda. Yeah? I'm more than happy to answer the question of what we think of the virus of the prophets. Yeah? I'm happy to say that Yasser Habib does not represent me or my school of thought, right? I'll be happy to explain, but not now. Now I'm talking about something different. Do you want to listen to it, brother? If not, see you later, inshallah. Yeah? Be confident. Don't be drawn into this. Okay. 
So avoid these topics. And if people will draw you into it, be confident, apologetic, and you divert them, not they divert you. Sorry. Yeah, um, <coughs> sorry. Yeah, regarding that, um, sometimes the topic that feels, kind of feels you know, what we have to be come up is that of, you know, the accusation of body And so, uh, okay, so I see people doing that. Uh, yeah, so again, so, so misconceptions. Tatbir, grave worshipping, what do you say about the companions? What's your view about Bakr and Omar? Brother, do you want the answer? Come back at 3.30. Okay? Brother, you believe in this. Do you want me to discuss it? Come back at 3.30, brother. Don't let them take the time that you've taken to, 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 to present Imam Hussain in that week. You in charge, not they are in charge. Don't get drawn into it. Yeah, but sorry, but things like that here is like directly relevant to discussing today. It's very difficult sometimes to take your account. Okay, I accept that. Yeah. Tatabiya, for example. Yeah, so grave worshipping, what for Mount Hussein? Well, yes, yeah, so it's a lot. When people's venues or when you hear about them, there's all sorts of things they hear about. So it's sometimes a bit of a Okay, I would distinguish between someone who's asking me to know, and I could tell from his approach, from the question. Not getting three, four people with him and saying, brother, you worship Imam al Hussein. Brother, you hit your heads with swords. Yeah? I could distinguish someone who wants to know about it and I would take him to the side and explain to him, I'm not trying to hide anything. I've got very firm answers and I'm very confident of this school of thought, of this religion. Alhamdulillah. So, if he's someone who wants to know, I will answer him or her in details on the side but if someone with agenda trying to distract the whole discussion, no. I would simply, if he doesn't want to move, I'll get the security to take him out. Yeah, be confident. I don't want you hiding, you know, behind the stone saying, sorry brother, we don't mean this. Yeah? Confident. It doesn't, if it is creating trouble, make sure the security people are right next to you. And if he's causing, you know, trouble, chuck him out. Alright? We don't want to talk to him. Why is he talking to us? Get him out. Be confident. Don't waste your time. Right? Your times are valuable. So don't waste them. And if there are time wasters out there, apologize. If they don't accept it, take them away. Okay? So, happy about Muhammad Hussain alayhi salam for Muslims. Yeah? A few key issues. I expect you all to remember them now. Because you're going to have to summarize them quickly to someone. Okay, now what's relevant to 97% of the population of this country? Imam Hussein for Muslims, for non Muslims. Salla ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Okay, so uh, imagine you have a non Muslim friend, colleague, who approached you and you know, you're trying to use the same approach to that uh, friend of yours. You're trying to say to him, do you want to know what happened to Islam 50 years lil Hijra? And you'd say, okay, it's an interesting information, but how is this relevant to me? Do you want to know the story about the man who saved Islam? You say, okay, he, this is a very noble, you know, cause, so saving a religion, but why is this relevant to me? Why are you telling me about a man who saved Islam? You've got to think of a different approach. Okay? You've got to think, as a listener, would you be interested in what you're saying? Okay, so he saved the three elements. Is that what you're going to tell him? He's going to, by the end of it, you know, I find it very informative and very noble of a man like Imam Hussein as but he would say, okay, that's very good. But why are you still remembering 14th century, 14th century Islam? And why are you telling me this? Are you, do you want me to convert to Islam? You've got to think of a slightly different route. You have to think, you're not trying to sell the idea, you're trying to present the relevance of the to these. And, it, and he is, sallallahu alayhi very relevant to the non Muslims in this country. I have three to four points to say about presenting Imam Hussain to non-Muslims. 
You should clarify that when you say, okay, Imam Hussain, the grandson of the Prophet, when we say he saved Islam, we don't mean he merely saved the style of performing certain rituals. And when you say someone, when you say to someone he saved Islam, he thinks, well, what you mean the way you pray? The way you perform Hajj? Is this what he saved? You've got, to, you've got to appreciate that when you say you saved Islam, the listener would be thinking, why is this relevant to me? Okay, you pray in a particular way. He saved the way you pray, so you go and pray. Noble act, but not relevant to me. You've got to make sure that when you say, Imam <coughs> Hussein saved Islam, even he saved something more than simply performance of rituals. He saved certain principles, concepts. And I'll go on to explain them one by one, inshallah. First achievement of Imam Hussein in his struggle, which is relevant to all mankind, is that he sacrificed his life to stop and prevent the manipulation of religion. Now religion, as you know, and religious authority is a very influential form of authority. Political authority, you're out of the office in four years with the next elections. But if you're a religious authority, your impact and your followers will extend beyond your town, city, country, and even beyond your time, if you have certain religious teachings, even after you're dying. So Imam Hussein, the way I would present one of the impacts, one of the significant achievements of Hussein to a non-Muslim, I would say to him, this noble man with his caliber sacrificed his life to stop the manipulation of religion. And a non-Muslim should think immediately on a global scale. Manipulation of religion, of course the manipulation of religion. Islam at the moment, Wahhabism, Osama bin Laden, wasn't he manipulating religion? and religious authority to create chaos. Yeah? That's a form of manipulation. And if you think this is restricted to Islam, you're quite wrong. Zionism manipulates what religion? Yeah. Judaism. Judaism. Yeah? And the Christian, some of churches, of the Anglican churches in America, you're absolutely right, they manipulate Christianity. And George W. Bush was a prime example. A holy war, the Crusades are coming, that we had to claim the land back, right? These guys, Bin Laden, George Bush, the Zionists, they manipulate religion. And if they manipulate it, it's very influential. And you could be, as a non-Muslim, you could be the victim of that. You could be the victim of the jihadist followers of Osama Bin Laden. Yeah? You could be the victim of a, of a, a car bomb in one of the... One of the